Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Dark Pulse's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Dark Pulse has two security platforms, fiber and ultra high sensitivity sensors. It uses advanced laser-based systems to provide rapid and accurate monitoring of temperatures, strains, and stresses. It can be used for pipeline monitoring, perimeter and structural surveillance, aircraft structural components, and mining safety. The company's fiber-based monitoring systems can detect a change in strain or temperature. Strain is the deformation of an object. For example, if their software was being used to monitor the tracks of a railroad, if the size of the tracks changed with temperature or damage, this system can detect that. So you can see it can be really helpful for airplanes and also for mining and construction. The company's patented BOTDA Dark Pulse sensor technology allows for the monitoring of highly dynamic environments due to its greater resolution and accuracy. Its offerings include a full suite of engineering, installation, and security management solutions to industries and governments. The company recently announced the acquisition of Teradata Unmanned, which is a drone-based company offering multiple platforms, including underwater capabilities. That means their software can be used underwater to track the temperature and change of an object, which could be really beneficial to the shipping industry. Teradata offers 3D mapping for industrial applications, such as 3D mapping of a waste management facility. It was originally started in 1989 as Cleaver Marketing. Cleaver's wholly owned subsidiary was Dark Pulse Technologies. Dark Pulse originally started as a tech spinout from the University of New Brunswick in Canada. In July 2018, the company changed its name from Cleaver to Dark Pulse and the ticker was changed to DPLS. The company's headquarters are in New York City and is currently trading on the pink sheets. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 431 million market cap. They're trading at nine cents a share and they have 4.8 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they don't have much free cash flow each year since they're still pre-revenue. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's also negative every year. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales, which is zero every year. In this article, someone asked the CEO when they will start generating revenue. He said in Q3 of this year, so they should be generating revenue right now. We won't find out for sure until they report their next 10Q. Below revenue is their operating expenses. Their biggest operating expense is general and administrative. That's, they do have a little debt on their balance sheet, so they paid over 400,000 of interest on their debt in the trailing 12 months, and they have negative net income every year. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. So they did have positive operating cash flow in 2020, negative in the other years. Here's a breakdown of their operating cash flow from their 10K. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income, then you add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then you adjust for changes in working capital. So the main reason they had positive operating cash flow is because they used a lot of credit. So this is more of a timing thing. They should have had negative operating cash flow in this period. They're just gonna have a bigger negative when they pay the accounts payable. Like for example, if you have $10,000 of cash in a the bank, then you buy $10,000 of electronics, but you use your credit card to pay for it. You still have the 10,000 of cash in your bank, but those electronics were a loan from the credit card company. You have to pay that loan back. So it's just a timing thing. So you're gonna to have to pay it back. And when you do, that $10,000 in cash will go away, but you'll still have the 10,000 of electronics. If a company has positive operating cash flow because they used a lot of credit, I wouldn't consider that a good thing. But if another company had lots of operating cash flow because they were really profitable on their income statement, that's a good thing. And they spend a little on CapEx each year. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. Since they're losing cash each year, they're running their business on debt. 
They added 1.1 million of debt in 2018, 180,000, then another 1.1 million. This is the equity section of their balance sheet, and this is as of 630, 2021. So they have negative 3.6 million of equity. They raised about $2.8 million from issuing stock, 477,000 from common stock, and 2.4 million from additional paid in capital. So that's about $2.8 million they raised from selling their business. And they lost $6.7 million from running their business. Accumulated deficit is a sum of all your prior net incomes. So if you had a business and you wanted to get more funding for that business and you asked a friend, will you buy my business for $2.8 million? But I'll still run the business and take a salary, but you own 100%, so you get all the excess money. And say your friend gives you a check for $2.8 million and you run the business, but you run out of that money, and now you need to take on debt, so you add four million of debt, and you lose all that money. So you lost the $2.8 million your friend gave you to buy the business, then you lost about four million dollars in debt that you got from family, friends, and the bank. Now you pretty much have no cash in the bank, and all you can show for it is a business that lost nearly seven million dollars. I'm not saying this is a terrible thing, and this is a terrible business, and no one should buy it. I don't understand their technology that well to give you an opinion on that. I just know the numbers. If their technology is really good, and if they can prove they're getting close to monetizing it, then they'll be able to get more loans, or maybe even sell more stock and dilute the current shareholders. So they obviously need to raise more capital to stay in business. Let's look at the capital structure. They have negative four million of equity, so their liabilities are four million dollars more than their assets, and they have two million of debt and their weighted average cost of capital is 10%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for, that's 591 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $431 million. We divide that by 4.8 billion shares, and we get a calculated stock price of nine cents. So I'm just showing you what their free cash flows we need to be to justify a nine cent stock price. This is just one scenario. Another scenario is we could smooth out this 43 million over 2021, 22, 23, and 24 and give them positive each of those four years and come up with nine cents. Or we can give them negative free cash flow for another 10 years and then positive after that. This is just one scenario. So do you think they can get positive 43 million of free cash flow by 2024. The average company converts 10% of their revenue to free cash flow. So this implies they would need 430 million of revenue by 2024. If you think they can do that, then maybe the stock is a buy. This stock was well under a penny last year. Then it shot up to five cents around February. It came back down. Then it shot way up to over 20 cents. So there's a lot of interest in this stock. Even though they don't have revenue, it seems like they're getting closer to getting revenue. And they are making some acquisitions, so maybe that's another reason people are buying the stock. They have a beta of negative 1.63, so the stock moves opposite the market. If the market goes up 1.5%, then the stock should go down 1.5%. And if the market goes down 1.5%, this stock should go up 1.5%. And in the past 52 weeks, the stock went up nearly 30,000%. So that means a $1 investment could have resulted in $298, or a $10,000 investment could have resulted in $3 million. The 52-week low was 0.0001 cents. That is equal to one ten thousandths of a penny. And the high was over 20 cents, and the stock is trading between its 50-day and 200-day moving average. This is a really popular stock. 73 million shares are traded each day on average the past three months. All the shares outstanding are on float. Let's look at their financial ratios. We can't look at the PE since they have negative net income. We can't look at the price of sales since they have no sales. And we cannot look at the price to book since they have negative equity. Their current ratio is zero. They have $200,000 of current assets and three million of current liabilities. They have about $150,000 of cash on their balance sheet. So it looks like they're gonna be short funds since they had negative 1 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months and negative three million to work in capital. So they're gonna need more debt or equity financing to run their business over the next 12 months. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 35 companies in the same industry as DPLS. 
and they're worse in every single category. They're pre-revenue, so they don't have good ratios. Plus, they have a zero current ratio and they're 100% debt. So to summarize, it looks like this company is really struggling, but if they get close to making sales, maybe they could be a really great investment. I don't really understand their technology, but like Warren Buffett says, he invests in things he understands. He understands Coca-Cola. When he first became friends with Bill Gates, for hours, Bill Gates tried to explain his business model to Warren Buffett, but Warren Buffett still didn't understand, so he didn't invest. Buffett acknowledges he should have invested. He could have made a lot of money, but he invests in things he understands. And as long as you make money, you don't have to invest in every single startup. Because for every Microsoft, there's 10,000 other companies that fail. So if he invested in all 10,000 companies, including Microsoft, he probably wouldn't make any money. I rank their free cash flows, revenue, and ratios 1 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.